the next presentation. Uh, they're both from the Canadian International Bureau of Shipping, and their topic is going to be the introduction to IMO and port state control. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to say it was a very pleasant evening last night, and especially the table I was on, we had a lot to discuss. It was very refreshing for me, sort of having been away from this for some time, because I used to be with Transport Canada, and a lot of the discussions were very familiar. Um, and um, I'm very pleased that um, my, my sort of boss, Said, who was going to come here, Said Nazif, to give a presentation, um, he'll be looking in as well. So we might be dialoguing between each other once in a while. Anyway, um, thank you for, I think we have an hour. I don't know how long the actual presentation goes on, but I know it, I've got an hour with questions and um, the actual presentation. So of course you are familiar with your own logo and that's uh, CIBS logo. And as, and as uh, stated, I'm a port state control is what we're for focusing all on, although I do bring in this kind of the work we do. I do a flag state quite often, so, um, but there's a real connection between it all. It's, it's more focusing on larger ships, um, recognizing that this is a marine community. A lot of, of those of you here are, uh, are in the uh, construction of pleasure craft, big, big pleasure craft, commercial craft, um, domestically anyway. Um, so some of you know this background, others of you don't. So anyway, it's a good refresher. Um, of course, I left my stick behind. What have I done with my stick? I probably poked. There we are. There we are. Yeah. That's the first faux pas of the day, isn't it? Um, so anyway, let's move on. Uh, so this is, uh, this is like size little rendition. I guess it's the first cruise ship that ever, I don't think they had coronavirus in those days. Um, anyway, thank you, Side, for that. Um, Shipbuilding, of course, uh, as we know, we go back years and years, 6,000 BC, then that, that uh, you know, we, we had uh, evidence of uh, ships uh, sailing, particularly in the Mediterranean, didn't have, of course, in those days, didn't have engines, there were, you know, wonderful Greek rowers or, 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 or others, and then we had sail, and I admire what they had to put up with in those days. But construction, of course, was important, and that's making sure that as far as possible the ships were um, seaworthy as far, as far as possible. So time moved on, and um, in the 1600s, of course, you had all these, oops, so we've gone too far. You had the um, different sailing ships, so brigs, barcantines, brigantines, so all of those wonderful um, uh, terms and clippers. And, uh, but of course, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, a lot was focused on the actual beauty of these ships, not so much on stability and the whole proportion. So, um, so then of course, um, one particular ship, you know, as I said, it dealt with the geometry and the lines and traces of ships. The drawings of the ships were similar to those of luxurious houses with elaborate decorations and designs. Thank you, Sai, si, that was a great description. I've inserted a little of, um, I also inserted up here. This is the Barsa, which is a typical, if you've ever been to Sweden and saw Stockholm, an incredibly uh, preserved um, wooden um, example. And although it's deteriorating in the museum, the history is such that in 1628, she capsized leaving Stockholm Within 20 minutes of leaving the, the berth, I understand, the second gust of wind sort of hit the ship and she capsized. Why? Because she didn't have the stability that was required in order to support two dun, gun decks, 64 dun, uh, guns on the, um, on the decks. And there were 30 lives lost and it sank. A huge embarrassment for King Gustav, who ordered the ship. Uh, and and uh, against the um, recommendations from the net Dutch architects that this would not be a stable ship, he insisted it should be built, and uh, and he and he looked and he watched as the ship just sank after capsizing. Uh, but it was then raised, of course, in a, about 30, 40 years ago. Or so, and it's a wonderful example of what, 
of, of a ship today. Anyway, I better move on. Um, then I need a bit of help with this because it's claimed that it was Pierre Bouget, who was, um, who was an astronomer, really became interested in, um, in uh, ship's architecture. All right. Um, and uh, there was an expedition to Peru to affirm that the, that the ship, uh, that the earth was indeed round. All right. So there was a lot of interest in the astronomy and it was through Pierre Bouget who wrote La Traite de Navire, and if you want to break into this side, please do, because I haven't done my research. But I do understand the diagram, as everyone here does, I'm sure, so I won't bore you with the Meta Center. But Meta Center is, I understand, the, it was Meta Centre, which is uh, a French name, because that's where it all uh, developed from. So, um, and the Meta Center, of course, is is vital for ship stability day to day as we do diagrammatically, as we apply it, as you do. Uh, another one of, of these nice, well, well done side, I like this one, you know, sort of a post piston marine diesel engine, I guess, um, because this is what came into being after the steamships um, came into being and then it was uh, taken over by, by using diesel driven ships at the second half of the 20th century. Um, and uh, I just remember being at sea on, on, I was with British India Steam Navigation Company. And of course we had the typical old Doxfords, which were probably operating in the same line. I just looked at a video the other day and I heard that sound of the Doxford and I felt I was 18 again as a cadet, you know, very nostalgic. Um, so regulations, of course, uh, that's specifically what I was doing in my last job as well, but why regulations are made? Well, I don't have to tell you, you know why. And of course, they have to inscribe a whole host of, whoops, well, sorry, there we are, uh, of areas such as uh, to ensure that there's sovereignty rights uh, between countries and there's justice, there's a financial component, and of course, uh, there's health and safety, and I've got to thank John for his last um, presentation dealing with safety on board. It's a great refresher for me when doing surveys on board. Uh, but this is also for the crews, because it's the crews and the officers who have to uh, conduct jobs on board and go into enclosed spaces, and et cetera, and to deal with emergencies on board. So safety is very much um, an, an issue on board. Larger ships, definitely, and also whatever ship you're on, even uh, uh, even wind surfers, making sure you've got your PFDs. Or I, though I never see people with PFDs, but they're supposed to have PFDs. Anything that's um, in the recreational com um, community as well have to observe the safety requirements. Security, um, as that's uh, since 9-11, certainly, that uh, there's a marine um, a component there of the security. Pollution, yeah, under MARPOL, those six annexes dealing with pollution uh, from ships and the protection of, of the marine environment. So let's just move on, um, sorry. Uh, so, Anyway, this all impacts the ships with respect to ship construction rules for navigation as well, and also for certification of uh, individual um, uh, crew members, officers, and engineers on board. So we go back in time. We all recognize this, uh, this classic uh, photograph of the Titanic, and we all know that uh, I, um, you question, if it wasn't for the history of this ship sinking, how long it would have taken before we got the solace in being. But this ship, of course, the sinking was, uh, was the cause for the, uh, for the solace to come into being in 1914. And then it was uh, modified 20, 1929, 1948, 1960, 1974. So with the protocols and the rest is history. So you know that. Uh, but it, was, um, it certainly was brought into being in the UK in 1914. Uh, 14. Um, so we know that shipping is international, it's just not one state. Well, the British and Merchant Navy used to be the biggest in the world once upon a time in the years gone by, 
but it is of an international uh, nature now that we have flags of convenience, Marshall Islands, Liberia, and we have all the other countries in the world, and that's how we do our trade. And that's helped the globalization we enjoy today. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's been recognized that, that uh, we have to improve the, the safety and, and to bring it up to an international level so that all the ships, the flags um, of the world are consistent. We don't have different regulations for different ports, and although there are some, there's a little bit of tolerance there. But by and large, when ships come into port, I'm talking about the big international ships, into foreign going ships, coming into port, then indeed, you know, there's a consistent approach, consistent um, standards uh, that are recognized internationally. So that brings us to the International Maritime Organization, um, which uh, came about in 1948 because of the United Nations developing all these or instituting these different agencies, uh, depending on what the interests were, and the International Maritime Organization was the, was the um, organization, of course, that we work with today to ensure that the ships of the world and there's uh, conform to certain standards so that each nation can adopt these standards into their own legislation. So the United Nations system, as I said, Security Council, General Assembly, Economic and Social Council, the Secretariat, and that's when we come to the, to the Trustee Council. This is when we deal with different agencies, and that's when we come down to the International Maritime Organization. But of course, I don't want to leave out the International Labor Organization. I'm not discussing that, but that really has an impact on seafaring as well, the standards that they should be conforming with. Um, L MLC 2010, of course, Maritime Labor Code, um, we have to make sure as flag and port state control inspectors that those uh, standards are adhered to, uh, which um, you know, is all part of port state control. Um, uh, was there, oh, sorry, somebody. Questions will be afterwards, I guess. Um, so here we go. This is the International Maritime Organization situated in London. And uh, there are the details, but I'm, I know you can capture this very quickly anyway on the internet. Um, I've been there a couple of times when I was working for Transport Canada. Very interesting place. And uh, actually, I was dealing with the, uh, the Marine Environmental Protection Committee at the time. Um, so what does it consist of? The, the world bodies in, in, uh, at IMO, um, like any organization, be be it ecclesiastical or an organization you're familiar with, there's a hierarchy and uh, as you have steering committees, working committees, and subcommittees, well similarly here we've got the assembly which is composed of um, all the members and the council that, uh, that I'll get into in a minute, minute. and then you've got all the, um, and then you've got all the committees and under the committees, uh, uh, the one that uh, comes that leads port state control and all the inspections deal with all of those subjects, in particular the loading of bulk liquid and gases, bulk liquid gases, flag state implementation, the responsibilities there for each flag state, navigation. So I can just enlarge on this in a minute. So the assembly is the governing body of the of the IMO is the assembly called the assembly. And as I said, it consists of all the members who are members of IMO, and it determines the focus and the work of the programs and it votes on the budget because it is costly, which, uh, you know, I don't know whether everyone pays up right up front or not. I don't, I'm not part of the interest there. Um, and they meet every two years. And uh, it really is, uh, yeah, so I, I, it's a real, real experience being there as far as I'm concerned, hearing not just the members, but a lot of observers and uh, statements and NGOs who've got interests outside of just the commercial business of shipping. Um, so again, um, the council performs functions of the organization. It's, it deals with policy making 
and drafts of international instruments and formal recommendations must be approved by the council. All right, it's made up of 40 members elected by the assembly for two years. So after two years, there's another election, you get uh, different um, um, member states being, being represent representing the council. Now the Maritime Safety Committee, uh, as I said, is made, made up of member states. Um, and uh, that's a Maritime Safety Committee is, deals with all the safety aspects on board the ships, um, you know, be it um, bias for firefighting, um, de dealing with the abandoning ship, the lifeboats, life raft, all the new technical appliances coming in and they will all be uh, uh, discussed and voted on coming out with with uh, new levels of regulation for uh, for regulations for um, for uh, partners to or, or for other nationalities to administrations to impose in their own language. Um, the legal committee, uh, the MEPC deals, of course, with all the MARPOL requirements, Annex One to Six, oil, chemicals, garbage. Uh, and uh, but I'll come to that in port state control shortly too, because it's a big focus. Um, the legal committee, I don't have too much to say on. Technical cooperation committee coordinates the work of the IMO in providing technical assistance in the marine field. Um, I actually had the pleasure of going to the Caribbean years ago because they needed help with um, with all the pollution that's happening from pleasure yachts actually it was more they called it nautical tourism and they wanted to come out with a code of conduct and that was um that was uh there were a lot of high level um imo people there i had been brought down from canada and i was part of that um which was a, a, you know, a great privilege um and they did come out with a booklet specifically for tourism because it was a lot of garbage to, that's um, floating around in the Caribbean, quite frightening. Uh, and then you've got the facilitation, uh, technical, uh, the facilitation committee is a subsidiary body of the council which deals with the IMO's work eliminating unnecessary formalities. Uh, IMO's objectives, again, is to promote maritime safety, security, and prevention of marine pollution. Um, as you know, ships have had bad names, uh, certainly in, in the latter part of the last century. I mean, with the, with the um, I'll get into some of the casualties, but, you know, the general public just doesn't understand a lot what, what improvements have taken place in shipping over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, but so, so it's important that... Uh, that uh, that the, the International Maritime Organization holds, holds up all of these um, good interests to ensure that uh, ships don't pollute. Um, so here we've got another um, slide on, on, on the IMO. Um, so of course, it is important, you can't just have international regulations. It's meaningless unless it's brought into, the, into each country's legislation. Um, uh, like in Britain, you've got, you know, the Merchant Navy, you know, the British North, my, but the acts in the UK, been away for too long, I know I sound it, but in Canada, you've got the Canada Shipping Act, of course, which was amended uh, in 2001, uh, big time. Um, that, as that, that brings in all of the, the adopted um, um, principles or the regulations, international regulations, and inscribes it within the Canada Shipping Act, so it becomes national law. And the same happens with the rest of the countries as a signatory to, to IMO as well. Some aren't, like uh, Taiwan, for instance. It's a little different because it's one China policy, but it's a separate country. They're not part of IMO, yet they do have a lot of ships. Um, so uh, they flag a lot of those ships offshore, but they do have their own flags as well. So they have some difficulty in, in uh, making sure that the ships comply and are not uh, impeded by port state control inspectors because they're not signatories. Um, so when a government accepts an IOMA, it agrees to make it a part of its own national law, just as I've said. Um, 
And so the flag states introduce their own instruments, but they're not, sometimes they aren't exactly the same. Maybe there's some little reasons that they want to adopt a close approach, but it's not exactly identical. So there's some, so the administration must, uh, must defend that if indeed it's, uh, it's a question by a port state control officer. Well, the administration for the ship actually would counter that. And uh, if it's very close to the safety, equivalent safety standards. So these are some of our principal in international um, uh, documents that we deal with. You recognize SOLAS, uh, MARPOL I've mentioned, SOLAS, the S uh, standards of training, certification and watch keeping. That is very important for port state and also for flag state to make sure that the officers on board are indeed qualified and they meet the standards and they've got the certificates uh, that are being asked for. All right. And don't forget, you've got some, you know, on the Marshall Island ships, they should have a Marshall Island certificates, notwithstanding the crew actually might be Philippine or come from Eastern Europe and their original certificates were, were sort of um, gathered from those in individual countries and then that is what we're still seeking is that the flag has accepted those certificates and they give them the flag certificates licenses on board those ships and so it's the government administrations must confirm that ships flying their flag complies with various international conventions related to safety security environmental protection uh, issuing statutory certificates to the vessel as well. And, you know, if you're in, in the domestic world, there's certificates issued to, to ships as well, or different sides. So Transport Canada certainly does that here for the domestic world. But internationally, again, uh, those foreign vessels coming into, into Canada, um, those certificates should be not just they shouldn't just be issued they've got to be valid and they've got to have the full scope and match all the equipment on board the ship they refer to the equipment or indeed have the annual endorsements okay so as we know the, the actual certificate the actual inspections for ensuring that ships do comply with the national standards can be delegated to ROs, responsible, um, responsible, responsible organizations such as CLASS, um, Lloyd's, ABS, you mentioned them in the, in the past. And that's some, something which has to be verified that, that that classification society, there's a statement, does represent that flag. Um, and as I said, certificates are issued after the initial renewal survey, which complies with the relevant requirements. So it's often, it's really good not to, for port state or flag state, to sometimes look at the close, at the small print to make sure that those standards are met, because there are some options. For instance, sewage treatment plants can have three different or, or four different types of, um, of um, of plants there, sewage treatment plants. And sometimes you have, you have to make sure that complies with the actual unit on board the ship. Um, okay, there must be the original certificates. We can't just have the, have the photocopies. Um, so this will be made sure that those are original. Um, and as we said, sometimes you do come across ships that don't meet the obligations of the flag or internationally. And uh, so, so then there are problems with the port state and the ships will then go through some, um, some closer inspection. Um, this is the Brer. The, of course, we've had, these are ships that were unsafe, but there's a story behind this one, of course, uh, uh, as to why she ran aground. I don't remember the details, but I, I was to understand there was more oil that was uh, during the storm ended up on the sheep that were just grazing this is up in the Hebrides or the Shetlands or whatever and it was a terrible mess and poor, these poor sheep were covered in oil awful so that's the Brer and then of course um, there were other accidents um, 
Um, these are not, these are more, the, 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 these are substantial accidents that have happened, groundings and casualties, which all led to, um, in the end, port state control. Um, so there was a special committee set up on flag state implementation to improve the performance of governments to ensure that ships don't become substandard, especially tankers. So that brings us to port state control because uh, the ships, as particularly around Europe, uh, which had been um, causing a lot of pollution, such as the Brer, the Erika, and then we had the Amoco Cadiz, which was really, that was the final straw before the Europeans got together to find out how can we impose restrictions or, or and, uh, to uphold the standards of ships coming into our ports in Europe. So the grounding of the Amoco Cadiz was is huge amount of, it was huge, pub, poor publicity for the, for the marine community or shipping community worldwide. Uh, so I'm sure you remember this at time. Uh, the owner operator, uh, all these ships, some, as, I, as I said before, you can, we know that you can have a ship owned by a certain nationality. It can be um, flagged elsewhere, crewed, uh, crewed somewhere else or crew come from another uh, nationality, nation, uh, recognized organizations can change. So port state control was a real key thing to have to, to make sure that uh, inspections can be, become harmonized. Also, all of these complications, when you get a grounding or a pollution, you've got all of these aspects to um, sort out. Um, so eight European countries met and developed a memorandum initially called the Hague Memorandum that developed into the 14 European states, which is now 27. So uh, the MOU on port state control was brought into effect, commonly called in Europe the Paris MOU. Um, and uh, Canada actually became part at, of the MOU in the early stages as well. Uh, so uh, along, that was, you know, probably the 80s, 90s. And that's when port state control started in Canada uh, for our ports. So we would be training our inspectors, or, or Canadian inspectors, we used to go over and train to get, make sure there was a consistent application of their, of, uh, of their approach to inspections. Um, so there are now re regional port state control agreements around the world, um, and there are nine of them, so that the globe can be pretty well covered off depending where the ships go. So if there's a substandard ship, they aren't gonna go very far. They're gonna be, they want to trade normally and, and get revenue, they have to go to countries which have adopted port state control MOUs. Um, as you can see, the Paris MOU and the Tokyo MOU, which is highlighted there, are the two that Canada is responsible for. And so really you've got to work with the two organizations. Some inconsistencies sometimes, but by and large, this is what, um, what Canada has uh, to, uh, to ensure. I think Paris MOU, because it's so established, is, is just, you know, normally gravitate to the principles of the Paris MOU because uh, it's, it was the first out there, more mature, and a lot of information is there. Bina Del Mar came into being in South America. Um, actually, I had the privilege of speaking down there at one of the, about pollution, and it was through the port state control uh, request. Uh, then you've got the Caribbean, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, Western Central Africa, Black Sea region, and uh, then you've got Riyadh, which is, came into being in 2005. So it's pretty well, pretty difficult for a ship to uh, escape these MOUs. And that gives the uh, pictorial uh, description of, um, of the MOUs around the world. See, all along, that just 
colors represent which uh, areas would rep would be representing the um, the uh, port state control regions. Um, then, so what is port state control? It's a spot check on visiting foreign merchant ships, not a full surveyor survey. It's a sort of a, an audit. Uh, uh, port state control will go on board and they don't necessarily go through the whole ship. They may be there for just for a couple of hours, all right, which I'll get into. They have to have grounds to go further if they were going to do a full blown inspection on board. It's a harmonized system, as I said. So what's done in, what's done in Canada, the approach by its inspectors would be the same as if it was in Australia for the Tokyo MOU or in Britain and France under the Paris MOU. Uh, it, it's enforcing compliance where the owner and flag state have failed their responsibilities. So it's another area. Port state control will be the measure of how, how well the flag is, is uh, and the, or rather the ship is being run and certificated and being safe and the flag administration is performing their duties. Um, requires deficiencies to be rectified if there is a substandard ship or it can be detained, which uh, that can lead to a ship falling into a sort of a blacklist, if you're a gray list or a blacklist. And finally, the ship can be refused access to the region if indeed it's that bad. So there are guidelines that are sent out that are followed with respect to the number of times a ship has, has not reached certain standards and then she could be banned from the region and it could be months, uh, weeks, it could be months. It depends on how severe it is. I thought I put some of these up, just a classic sort of, um, this isn't today, this wasn't yesterday. Uh, some years ago, these are photographs taken of some of the, um, there's a ship that's overloaded, of course. Um, and maybe it's a grain ship, but you can see it's sort of substandard. There's a typical sort of fractures you might come across in your world as well with smaller vessels. Uh, there we are. There's a, the, the, these are ex not exaggerated, but these are major defects, which Seldom are you going to find this on board ships now, um, not the ones I've been going on. The most of the ships I've been inspecting are around five years old. Um, but uh, to come across a 15 year old ship is the ones I'm dealing with very seldom. Uh, that looks dodgy. The holes in the deck, of course. Um, these are all extreme examples. There we are, that's uh, all the dogs. See, they're missing the actual dogs around there. And, and uh, often you find that this is so seized, you can't, you can't, you, you can't uh, ensure that the enclosures are tight. And here we go. Um, I don't know exactly what this was actually, but you can see just looking at it, well, there's got to be something wrong here. Because, um, I put this up as well because actually I got this from Taiwan when I was out there. That this is actually how they were boarding sh ships in Taiwan. Uh, I don't think you would be doing this here, and I certainly. So the standards. It was well, very interesting because I, I do a little bit of training out there. And it's very interesting the ships you come across. It's like going back forty years, you know, because you, they are not part of the MOU, um, and so. But I was very strict about boarding ships. This is a no, 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 definitely. Uh, useful websites, of course. Just cl clock into these it websites. That'll give you a lot of information about if you're interested in the port state control, Paris MOU, and the Tokyo MOU. Which again, that's what Canada subscribes to. Um, and of course, we want to eliminate substandard ships in the region. I think this is an old SAP Marine ship, actually, passenger ship, or British, British and Commonwealth ship years ago, probably anchored off Falmouth. Um, so what else do we do for the port state control? Well, as with flag state, I'm pushing that a little bit, because really we do the same thing, but it's just uh, captured at a different level. 
uh, it's very important when there's port state control comes on board, officer comes on board, he may just go and go through the certificates, everything's okay and he'll leave the ship. And there's, there's other cause, as I said, to go further. But the officer's certificates is important, making sure that all the certificates are there, that there are enough crew on board, the officers are on board. One ship I went on board, there was no mate. And I was told one of the mates, um, he, he was sent home. And I said, well, when you're sailing, well, I'm sailing tomorrow. I said, well, well, what's going on? Oh, the second mate is going with mate. Well, I mean, that doesn't work, right? So um, numbers, safe manning certificate is important to, to juggle. Um, crew licenses and documents I've mentioned, uh, issued by the flag administration. Uh, ship certificates, you know, safety equipment certificate. That's the one I always gravitate to in the supplement. MARPOL, the International Maritime, the International Pollution Prevention Certificate. Um, and the safety construction, so I can rattle on. Air pollution, of course, that's a big one, Annex 6 now. Um, cruise certificates, I mentioned, they've got added ones, other, other certificates such as ECTIS, that the ship's crews have been, a lot of it's focused on the operations. With a brand new ship coming here internationally, I'm concerned about the crew. Can the crew actually perform their duties on board. They haven't been on board the ship since the shipyard, only since the shipyard um, departure, and they haven't really got to know the ship as well as they should. That's what I'm concerned about with the new ship. Um, but they should also have certificates for, say, uh, GMDSS for the um, radio, um, uh, for the radio responsibilities, um, uh, medical, uh, security, uh, who's in charge of medical or security. So these are, and also their own medical certificates, making sure they're fit to do their duties. Uh, shipboard areas to inspect. Well, of course, uh, before boarding external hull, before going on board. Hours of rest and fatigue. That has been a very highlighted area recently with respect to under the ILO, or the, rather MLC convention, and also under the watchkeeping convention. I think, uh, yeah, so th that is very difficult to comply with sometimes. ISM code speaks for itself, maritime security, uh, with respect to the gangway, you know, that uh, uh, the, the gang was a gangway watchman on board, that it's MARSEC 1, MARSEC 2, uh, that they've got all the grills in place, they've got all the lockers closed, they have their drills to make sure that, that if there was a security risk, be it um, a, you know, an extreme thing, a bomb threat, uh, or a stowaway, which isn't so serious, serious, but it, nevertheless, it's all in part and parcel of security, marine security. Wheelhouse navigation deck, of course, we've got navigation equipment that has to be checked out. Radio, the compass deck, well, actually, that's Monkey Island, isn't it? And the compass itself, um, external superstructure, <clears throat> uh, the condition. So these are things you understand. The boat deck, the instructions, how to launch life rafts, lifeboats, for, uh, the free fall lifeboats, or so and so forth. Here we go. Uh, main deck area, hatch covers, and hold access. Um, again, making sure that the, that the ship's holes are indeed um, uh, protected from the ingress of water and the, all the rubbers around the hatches are, 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 are really tight and new, renewed frequently. Um, and also the drainage areas uh, do work as well, the little non-return valves on the hatch. Uh, now I come to uh, the uh, promotional aspect of CIBS and Sai, do you want to say anything particular here? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you so, so much, James. Actually, just a very short introduction to uh, our team. Uh, we are a nine inspector. We cover from the east to west coast of Canada, three permanent surveyors in, uh, in Vancouver, and we have uh, Scott Kennedy in, Van in Halifax. We have in Quebec, Montreal, we are all nine surveyors and we are all master mariner or chief engineer, uh, ex Lord Register or ex DNV or ex uh, Transport Canada. So, um, mainly as uh, James uh, mentioned, it, 
uh, we are uh, we work with government. We were we representing the Panama, the Liberia, the Marshall Islands, and many other flags. Uh, we have now about twelve or thirteen flags that we represent in Canada. So when foreign ships from Panama come to Canada or from Marshall Island, and uh, it have to be inspected annually, and uh, depending where is the ship in the region, so the government will contact us directly in the head office and uh, we're going to delegate the uh, work wherever the job is as uh, uh, James you know he can go on board and do the full inspection on behalf of the flag who hire us to do the inspection and of course we are uh, maintaining a quality management system we are in ISO 9001-2015 uh, we are a CDI inspectors and uh, we help a lot of um, of our Canadian clients, mainly when they're going to go abroad uh, to change the flag. Uh, we are the deputy registrar for now, uh, I think six flags. So we do a lot of changing the flags from Canadian to foreigner flag, mainly when the ship is going for one trip or scrap. So they prefer to change the flag and change the crew and change uh, uh, all the classification societies. And this is what our duty to, to help them. So that's, I just make a very close uh, uh, thing you know, um, to introduce our company. And again, thank you so much, uh, James, and thank you for the IMS uh, to inviting us to do the presentation. Thanks, Saad. The next slide, maybe if you go for the next slide, I'm just going to tell that uh, we are mainly moving a lot with the, uh, uh, training. We have about now 12 training approval by uh, Transport Canada. So all the mandatory course under the STCW, uh, we are now at the CIPS Academia capable to uh, deliver the uh, training. And uh, actually we have access to Transport Canada database with a password and we deliver the certificate to the seafarer uh, of course, the Canadian one. And same thing, we are approved as the Maritime Academia by the Marshall Islands, which is the Marshall Island is the second biggest flag in the world after the Panama. So uh, also, I just want to mention that we are also uh, a training institution. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I guess we're at the question period. And Sai's not running away either, because if I can't answer it, he'll try and help me out. <laughs> well, I'm here. Okay, okay. So it's been a, anyway, um, any questions? Yeah, great. So I'm actually going to get that microphone off you because otherwise they won't hear online. So okay. let me just ferry around the microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was just asking uh, what you find is the most common non-conformities when you do your uh, inspections? So I'll be gravitating to the bridge. Um, uh, okay, from a, a more minor point is, is uh, often you find that older equipment isn't being used, like the magnetic compass is often, uh, you know, hasn't been used. It's on the monkey island and it's just neglected. But in today's world, you think, well, it's a minor thing, but actually it is very important. You still got the conventional magnetic compass. And that often is, is, is being subjected to, you know, neglect. Um, I would say, I don't know whether you would take on from this um, side, but I would say um, I am having difficulty more recently with fire drills, the operational side, and abandoned ship. Um, there's, on some ships, they have been rather lax. Uh, so I've had the drills performed a couple of times. But I mean, I'm speaking as a flag state inspector, but it should be no different from a port state inspector. Actual defects, more often than not, again, it's probably dealing with some of the safety equipment on board. Um, it, structurally, you know, I mean, they've been inspected. I mean, don't forget, or, uh, flag state, well, flag state's more of an inspection. Port state is an audit. so you'll dig deeper if you find out that, hey, wait a minute, 
that certificate doesn't rely, doesn't seem to be questionable, in which case you'll delve into the actual equipment and see what the, uh, what the difference is. So they'll get into some de de deeper, deeper inspection um, tactics. Yeah, I would say, um, let me see, uh, hours of rest I've had problems with. You know, uh, it's where hours of rest haven't been conformed with, but it, they should be, and it shouldn't be fudged, you know. But shipping is shipping. And I used to be at sea, and I know very well the hours that I used to work, and it's well outside of the today's um, hours of rest. Uh, um, Saeed, do you want to add to that? Any, the main yeah, problems yeah, you found know, on board? It, it is a good question. Actually, like if I was said 50 to 20 years ago, mainly the, the, uh, the critical deficiency or the critical equipment that we find was a safety equipment, such as a fire pump not working or the lifeboat uh, not going down. Or, uh, and, uh, but these days, to assure you that most of the Canadian ships, after they post the control at Next for Transport Canada, they, to, they took full control to uh, eliminate any substandard ships coming to Canada. So we don't really receive a lot of uh, uh, any substandard ship that really lead to a detention. Uh, even though ourselves, we have the full power to detain the vessel after our inspection. If a major critical uh, equipment is not working, we're going to detain the ships until uh, it's been fixed and tested and witnessed and to allow the ships. So the most, um, I would say, deficiency that we find in Canada because we do also abroad. Uh, it's mainly uh, ISM, some equipment of the quality management or training do not took place. Like James also mentioned about fire drills. They don't practice enough the fire drills. So we give them the best advice to ascertain that the fire drills uh, is taking place. Is that well answer? Yeah, thank you. I have one other small one again, but more in your world as well. The rescue boat on board these large ships it was for man overboard for other reasons. I always get those lifted, swung out, inspected, equipment, etc. And so many times you find that the outboard engine isn't working. Even yeah. a piece of carry boat, grounded is not vulnerable for that amount of time. Grounded is very good at those sales standards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, when you really need it, you need an outboard engine for a small craft. I mean, you know, and you can't get that thing going. You know, that, that you need it now. I mean, even when it's working properly, you can't get down to deal with an emergency fast enough. So I find that I always home in on the every ship I go on. I make sure, although it's not specific, I will make sure that, well, that's my pet peeve, basically. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, in, ter in terms of, um, as an inspector for the, you're an inspector for the International Bureau of Shipping, is that what you are? Yeah, but uh, we sort of work on the other flags, like Okay, I'm just wondering what kind of sort of independence, or maybe I should say security of sort of tenure or whatever you have. Like if you're a government employee while, while you're doing it, while you're acting for Transport Canada, you probably weren't overly concerned that you were gonna get fired if you were too strict in the approach that you took to a ship. And I'm wondering if when you're acting for one of these other organizations, are you just sort of hired on a year to year basis and you could be let go at any time if uh, they don't like what you're doing? Or do you have, are you relatively confident that if you take too hard a line that you'll still have a job six months from now or something like that. Well, my boss is typical. Um, that is, um, you know, my boss is there and he could fire me any time. He'll say, oh, James, I'm not pointing you anymore. No. Can you answer that, Sai? Yes, sir, certainly. It's a good question. You see, <clears throat> we are all have, uh, we work with the government and uh, uh, with the government, not Canadian government. We, re we represent foreign ships coming to Canada and it's the government of Marshall Island or Panama will contact us to ascertain that the ship, and this is annually, to ascertain that the ship meet the minimum requirement for the international uh, trade. So, um, so for us, 
is not an issue um, to be strict. And actually, the flag or the government request us to please, we do not want to see any deficiency. So these days, life has changed. It's not like, please, Mr. Inspector, let me go. And uh, or if you are too strict, I'm going to fire you. Is the customer, which is the government, would request us to be very strict. And uh, as James and myself, everyone, we try to do our best not to find a deficiency because every deficiency find on board the ships by uh, different government, such when the ship coming to Canada and transport Canada on with the hat of the post control, go on board and find the deficiency, uh, he will put it on the website. And uh, so there's no more a government or a flag administration want to see their name uh, in, the, in the website that the ship has been detained or deficiency and so on. So, um, and there is more you have deficiency, more the administration, when I said administration, which is the government, like Panama, Marshall Island and so on, you have three categories. You have the white list, the gray list, and the black list. So government do not want to see themselves in the black list. So actually they ask us, please do your best and please dig as much as you can to find deficiency. And this is our duty is to ascertain that the ship, so nobody will fire, fire us because we are strict and actually they're begging us to be as strict as possible. Can I just add to that, uh, Said? I, I, I would look upon our role, I mean, I'm going back into flag, flag state. The flag state, I mean, I'll attempt to get on board the ship before the port state come on board. We're the filter of problems. So we'll try and we'll capture the problems to get them addressed, if possible, before the port state come on board. Because they're the ones, you know, more of a black cap guy, I mean, I used to work for the organization, but they're doing their job. The port state, they've got a very, you know, they represent the public of, an, of, you know, of the country being visited. So it's important. So the flag state will make sure that you dig as much as you can, but you're a little bit more of a friend to the, to the ship and the master because you want to get things right. But you'll write them up what the issues were, and that will be sent back to the administration who will speak to the who will send it to the dpa and the dpa will make the designated person ashore will make sure that that is fixed so it, it it's a sort of a circle if you like it's and it's a good process then the port state control should come on board and not find anything that is different from the flag state but it does happen it does happen you know anything else and that's just an annual inspection wherever the ship happens to be around the world. Okay, well, now, if you're talking about flag, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about port state control, they've got the Paris MOU and the Tokyo MOU. They select ships differently, but Canada has to honor both systems. Whichever is more strict will be applied. You've got what they call the P1 ships or P priority one ships, priority two ships, depending on the record of the ship, the actual flag of the ship at the time, I'm talking about port state now, or the, um, you know, the classifications, the history, uh, how, many, how many deficiencies, et cetera, there'll be points scored against the ship, and she would be inspected more regularly. Maybe she's gonna be inspected in three months time, as opposed to a clean ship coming in, and then she falls into maybe in a 12 month or even an 18 month, She's a very low risk. So we have a risk pro profile under port state, all right? We don't have that in flag state. Flag state, we just go on board and we will inspect the ship annually. So we've got two more questions here, can I? Yeah, my question to Saeed here. Uh, Saeed, do you provide an ISPS training for seafarers? Yes, uh, we, yeah. Uh, we are approved by Transport Canada and the Marshall Island, the government of the Marshall Island, uh, to deliver the training course and to issue a certificate, which is recognized by uh, Transport Canada and by the Marshall Island. And how, how often the, the course is, is placed or, or planned? Like um, actually, we do it by demand. You know, uh, even if sometimes it's two people, 
uh, we had actually yesterday Captain Drago in here. We uh, we had one guy begging us, please, I need the certificate to get the job. And we tell him, okay, come on in. And he give it on one-on-one. -on -one. So um, compared to other administration or other school who have to wait 10 or 12 people to deliver the training, right. if, if it's one person, we can make him, you know, to help the industry uh, to move back on the sea, you know, and so on. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got um, a couple of questions here. <clears throat> what what is um, considered as an original document that require for certificate? <laughs> because I got I got uh, a couple of cases now where um, the post date presentation seventeen because the original was not accepted, although it was taken from the electronic file, and he was not. That as an original, he looked at a copy and put 17 citation. That's for the PNI club coverage, and also for a certificate of wreck removal and bunker convention that was sent but had not received or got on board the car. Uh, the original had not received the, the ship yet. He got the copy and verify copy from the certificate but not the original on board and secondly uh, lately we found that the port state waiting for a ship coming in after being sitting in two to three weeks of the anchorage and then they put citation 17 on no fresh fruit on board at the time they're coming to birth and of course there's no fresh fruit on board but it's ridiculous and uh, so there, there are two questions there, right? Um, uh, it's, deta it's detailed and I can't speak. I mean, it's sometimes a story, um, there are two stories, three stories, and I'm hearing from you. And I mean, all I can say is I, it, it, the first one deals with the bunkering and the bunkering receipts, as I understand. No, 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 certificate. certificate. From the government. From the government, from, from, from the administration. Yeah, they were sent yeah. From uh, astray, it yep. hadn't reached the ship, but they got the, the copy from yep. the, from the well, email. Okay. Um, a verification that was issued and all of these things. Yeah. Uh, and for the PNI club, mm -hmm. they issue only electronic format. Yeah. An electronic design, yeah. which the portrait will not accept. And that was here or was in here? Well, again, I'm, you know, I can't speak to the detail. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying that from a, as far as I could see that this would be a letter from the administration somehow to cover this situation saying uh, that, you know, that this is, that the administration is content with the process or the, uh, or, or, or the actual, um, the, the letter that, that's being confirmed or the copy and that statement should really be satisfying the port state yeah. but again this is detail uh, and I don't think I could comment on the detail I, I think uh, if I may uh, James uh, sorry sorry no, no worry I think it's a good question and I agree with the gentleman who asked the question and also your reply is correct uh, like the Marshall Islands Denmark and many other uh, administration have now uh, accepted to have an electronic copy. As you know, every ship, they have so many certificates, radio certificate, construction certificate. There's, I don't know, maybe 50 certificates they have to carry original on board. But now with the facilitation, they uh, have uh, electronically copy is accepted. And as you mentioned, there is a letter and a circular if you go on the Marshall Island example, there is a circular available, which I can share with the person who asked the question, that they said the Marshall Act, uh, administration accept to, for the ships to carry only electronic copy. But this circular with the letter have to be in the file to confirm if post control come on board, he will reply, yes, we don't have hard copy, but we have the administration confirming so if the post-it control do not accept it, this is where we come 
and help the flag and the master to find a way to facilitate with transport card. I said, listen, it makes no sense to write a deficiency. You know, Marshall Island accepted. Again, it's the flag that has the responsibility for that ship and yeah. to demonstrate and if it's okay with the flag, then it should be okay with the port state if the port state control officer knows what his business is. It's the flag state that has the covering letter, as you said. They have the authority to say, this is our process in the, under these circumstances. Yeah, I had it on board that may endorse it, but it's certified to do copy. So that's, that's okay for me. That's, uh, but, uh, it, Can uh, hear. It just seems to be uh, a new thing where uh, some of the people that in the board they just completely understand. Yeah. Well, he can't hear. Sorry. Can't he? Okay. No, because I need to take yeah. my phone. Yeah, oh, please take it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm holding Sorry. it. Yeah. But I can answer the second one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. The second one, um, because, yeah, there have been ships that have run out of, um, have run out of food, um, and uh, they shouldn't. They should be um accommodating the crew on board and because it's not just that it's got the itf that we're getting involved in other concerns as well um, um i i was dealing with a situation like this once but it was credible because the unforeseen circumstances so to actually sanction a ship that's um that's judgmental i would think that you know i can't speak for the actual officer but i think that's unreasonable my personal opinion i had been on board a ship here with almost empty stores but they were loading it that day i was called down by the administration and they were coming on very quickly this is how much we pay back for me the, the, the statement that is being you have one, one was basically that they got the new stuff on board but they hadn't got time to sort out the older one so there was something in the spot of uh, decay, and that was uh, basically guaranteed in the port of Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it well, it's a, it sounds a bit hard to me. I mean, but it's, you shouldn't get rotten stores, that's for certain, because you're paying for it, or the ship's paying for it. No, no, it was, the, the new stuff was on board, it was okay, but the old one, Mm. They hadn't had time to okay. sort of like loading it and yeah. stuff, so they hadn't had time to sort out the old one and, and take in the stuff, you know, what was uh, stuff that came. Yeah. You can't throw it over at the end. No. <laughs> no. Uh, anything else, Said? Well, you know, um, this is part of the service that uh, we, uh, the CIBS team, offer. When you have an issue with the posting control, uh, that make that maybe overpower or uh, this is the service we offer. Don't hesitate to call us, and one of <coughs> us will get in touch with you, and we can go on board and see. Like for a detention, as they mentioned, that the ship was at anchor for one week or two week, the, it could have the chance to get the food on board, and the ship was detained for that. So uh, that's something that we could the, the part of our service that. Uh, we help the industry, you know, to uh, to facilitate with the post control. Okay. More for any more? Oh, one more. Last question. Thank you. I just wanted to share some comments to this gentleman's uh, difficulties. Yes, so uh, there are certificates that need to be on board in original, but uh, also, the IMO has passed uh, facilitation whereby um, photocopies or PDF copies authentically received are acceptable. In such cases, a copy of that legis the IMO uh, legislation must be kept with the copy. Now, for example, uh, some flags, as he said, Marshall Islands, and I know Liberia as well, do not issue original certificates. They issue them only in electronic copy. But they insist that their electronic copy is filed on board with the IMO authentic authenticating uh, directive. 
So that must be kept in mind. PNI clubs have almost all discontinued issuing paper copies. All certificates are in electronic version. Most of them are also going into black and white so that there is no discrepancy of their certificates having to be in color print or in black and white print. A notable club that does this, I can say immediately, is the North of England. Their logo also is imprinted in black and white and it is accepted. If you are in a situation where the surveyor is sticky, largely because he's not aware of this, I would recommend, sir, that you should get the correspondent in that port immediately and endorse a copy. Or even easier, get the club to send the port state officer uh, the certificate directly. Or get the flag state to send that copy to the port state office directly. And you will save yourself a lot of time and grief. And now my question to uh, James here is, you are serving uh, what are essentially commercial registers. Right. Uh, they're not really national registers. Uh, that's why you are, you are uh, contracted to provide services. Uh, how do you differentiate in your standard of inspections or audits between the, f the various flags when you go on board? Now, I heard uh, the comment that the flags, your, your principles are begging you to record deficiencies. I would disagree with that. I think that would be bad business for you. Yeah. All right. To be recording deficiencies galore. Because your principal is going to ask you why. He's going to be at risk for losing that ship from his flag. And you are going to probably lose business from him. So let's be pr pragmatic and practical here. That's not what's going to be accepted. So how do you differentiate if you're going from a Marshall Island flag ship to Panama to another flag from wherever in terms of your variation, your differentiation and standards? Because that also matters. There are owners who look for the more benign and lenient flags for these reasons. Now, when you as a third party commercial inspection service go on board to inspect, you will have to respect those different degrees of safety or security standards as might be required, even though the arching legislation is the same. I can reply to this one, James, if you want. Yeah, oh, oh, I, okay, you go ahead, Ty. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my colleague who uh, asked those questions and in our reply and in all our inspectors uh, we are paid by the flag you know the flag is our clients and uh, and I can assure you even the DPA will request us you know to be as hard as possible with always with tactful I mean uh, that's not for, we're not going to write a deficiency for something, you know. When we see deficiency, we mention to the master. If he fixes it immediately or whatever, we don't even write about it, you know. Uh, most of the flag or most of the ships when we go on board, uh, we are here merely to help also the master that the ship should not be detained or find a deficiency. So, um, I would not agree with you that we are worried about our uh, job. And James can confirm more. Uh, we do meetings monthly and we continue confirming that we want to continue the most professional service we provide. Uh, we are not caring that if we have a job tomorrow or if Marshall Island or Panama decide to say, said, Saeed, you and your team are too much strict. We are going to continue to be uh, not necessarily strictly like with the attitude. We can continue to be very professional, but if something is not working, we can wait to inform the master that, Captain, you better fix it, you know, and, and if you fix it, we close it. It's better than a government like Porsche Control come on board, find the deficiency, detain you, and put it on the website, and you're losing, you know, your reputation, you're losing your, uh, your chartering uh, system, you know, because when you charter a vessel, more you have a deficiency or detentions, more the charter payment will go lower, you know, to writing. 
So uh, for anyway, I'm talking about CIBS team uh, that uh, we are treating the same inspection as for Panama, as for Liberia, because we also Liberia, we also Panama and Marshall Island in the same way. Everyone have a different checklist, but uh, uh, of course, before we detain or before anything, you know, uh, the inspector on the field will call me and I'll be in touch with the flag and seek his opinion. And most of the time, uh, also Jibs had this, uh, this experience, we re reply, we get the information from the flag, please detain the ship, do not allow to sail. And we do it, you know, so uh, I don't know how it was in your time, but uh, we are not looking for a financial or commercial issues. We are here to, for the uh, safety of the ships and the people on behalf of the government. Can I just add to that? Yes, I mean, this is port state IMO, IMO presentation and we drifted into this because we do the flag states. I don't have a problem myself because I only do Marshall Islands. I have one standard and we got a very healthy group. There are about four of us as, and we make sure we're consistent. One guy used to work for Lloyd's, the other two is transport as well and very experienced in port state. So this is dealing with the flag state. Um, and uh, there are audits also where an inspector from the states can come up and they will work with you to make sure that you're keeping a standard or they'll audit your reports. So I think there are safety nets there to ensure that the standards are met. Me personally, well, fortunately, I don't have to do this. I'm doing this because of my marbles, <laughs> to make sure that I might keep my marbles. So I'm never swayed. And if anything, um, I've been criticized for putting too much in. Right, Rockton. I'd just like to take this time to thank you very much, both of you and Saeed, for, uh, for your time and your presentation. And uh, just to let you folks know, uh, unfortunately, I've been informed that 